Hi, I'm Stephen Bruce. I run the Academy of Physical Medicine and here's 45 minutes of free CPD for you. This is just an example of what we do. We run a free session every month along with 70 plus hours of live learning with others CPD every year. If you'd like to see more, click the link in the info section below the video and that'll take you through to our website. Enjoy. Today, I am joined by Simon Meller. For Simon, is this the third or the fourth time we've had you on? I can't remember now. A couple third. of times, I think, yeah, a couple of times. Yeah. Simon is one of the orthopedic consultants at Total Orthopedics in London. Um, he's been on to talk about the hip on a couple of occasions before. Today, Simon, we're going to talk about uh, perphase and hip dysplasia. Um, first of all, what did you discover from your research in your dictionary? Should there be an apostrophe in perphase or not? Yeah, so I discovered that, uh, yeah, Perthase was a German with a, an S on the end of his name. So you're quite right. The, the apostrophe should be after the S. Right. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, the, the full name, Leg Calve Perthase disease, uh, named after Dr. Leg, an American, Dr. Calve, a French surgeon, and Dr. Perthase, who was in Germany in 1910. And for the benefit of the audience, this is because... Um, when I first created the slides, I put an apostrophe at the end. I think, Simon, you stuffed one in the middle. When I looked it up on Wikipedia, because I don't have a medical dictionary in the studio, there was no apostrophe at all. So we had a little bit of a discussion about that before we went live. Anyway, I'm glad we, we've satisfied ourselves on that one. We're uh, sorted. Where, where would you like to start on this, uh, Simon? Uh, well, I thought that it would be nice to just run through a few slides I prepared just as a framework, maybe just as a, a mild aid memoir for your uh, viewers. Uh, to just run through some information about first Perthase disease and then to talk a little bit about developmental dysplasia, if that's okay. Yeah, please do. So, yes, Perthase disease is a, a childhood condition, uh, which is rare, the first thing to say, it's very unusual, uh, but um, is significant nonetheless. It's uh, best described as an avascular necrosis process within the femoral head of a child. Uh, and uh, it is most commonly seen in males. There's about a four to one ratio, boys to girls. Uh, and the uh, most common age uh, diagnosis is about six, although a lot of children will have had symptoms sometimes for a considerable period of time before they get diagnosed. What, it's what unusual. Is it? So there's a number of possible uh, reasons why it happens. There's obviously an interruption of the, the vascular flow. Uh, in some case, mm -hmm. some people think that uh, there's uh, microvascular problems with uh, clotting abnormalities. Um, obviously, in some children, therefore, if they have an underlying clotting abnormality, uh, they may be more at risk of it from happening. Uh, but what's very interesting is that we see it more frequently the further north you go, uh, certainly in this country, um, the instance in, in the south of England is much lower than it is up in the, the north of England and Scotland. Um, and that may be related to socioeconomic factors because it is identified that it's more common in lower socioeconomic uh, groupings. Uh, it may be something to do with um, the way that babies are uh, looked after and children are uh, treated. Um, there's a, possibly a, a link to passive smoking. Uh, and some people have wondered whether a repetitive micro trauma is, is to blame as well. Uh, that's because it's been noted that it's more common in hyperactive children. So does, this, does perthase actually occur after birth? Or is it present at birth? No, no, no. It's something that starts for most children uh, after the age of four or five, uh, although it's usually about the age of six that it's diagnosed. But there's a spectrum of ages. It's, it's very rare below the age of the age of about three or four. Uh, and it's quite unusual if the child, child gets beyond the age of about seven or eight. And is it, is it always unilateral? No, you can get bilateral birth age disease, uh, but it is more common uh, uh, to be unilateral. Okay. Um, you've, put, you've put up some prognostic factors here, I think. Um... Yeah, so, so the main factor to be note, aware of that, that uh, the younger the child is when the symptoms start or when the diagnosis is made, uh, the better. Uh, and how much of the femoral head is involved. These are probably the, the most important prognostic factors. There are a number of classification systems based on radiological findings, which are helpful for some people to identify which are the, the children more at risk of a poor outcome. Uh, but really the most significant ones are the age and the severity of, of head involvement. Um, if you're very young, then uh, often children only have to be monitored uh, 
uh, with infrequent uh, clinical assessment uh, and avoidance of sports activities. And that's all that needs to be done um, because they have more time, more growth ahead of them to allow for good remodeling to occur. It's a, it's a long time since my children were of this age and uh, my wife would probably uh, um, assert that I didn't pay much attention to this sort of thing either. But are children routinely screened for this or would you no. wait until there's some sort of symptom or something? No, no. in fact that's why sometimes there's a bit of a time delay between the onset of symptoms and formal diagnosis uh, because there will be a lot of children who will just complain of a bit of a sore knee uh, and somebody maybe notices that they have a slight limp and then it's ignored or, or, or maybe somebody just looks at the knee, which is not actually the source of the problem, but is the site of the symptoms for some children. And that's why there's a bit of a, a quandary for a diagnosis. When it's, when it's obvious, it's very simple to diagnose, but in those early phases, it can be difficult. The disease oh, goes through a... Oh, sorry, I was, I was just wondering. I mean, obviously you've said that the earlier the diagnosis, the better. So... Um how long before symptom signs become apparent do you think the problem starts is it a very oh, short time or could it be years no no it's usually about six months on average um and uh, it can be very difficult to pick up those very early cases mm. um if you have a high index of suspicion then then that's fine uh, but uh, of course the the most common scenario uh, the most important message to get across the the limping child is not to be considered lightly. Uh, it's an important uh, process, a diagnostic process to run through and consider the possibility in a child of the right age that this could be Perthes disease. Uh, and um, knee pain often is referred pain from the hip joint. Yeah. Uh, and that should trigger appropriate clinical assessment and if necessary, uh, radiological analysis. And you've put up most all your slides here, I think, are uh, X-ray slides. I take it that that is the best way to diagnose this, even in its earliest stages? By the age of, by, by six months after the onset of symptoms, if it is Perthes disease, you will see radiological changes. Uh, if you're lucky and you have a high index of suspicion, uh, sometimes uh, these kids will get an MRI scan because the X-rays look normal in the very early phases. If somebody has that high of an index of suspicion, you'll see some of the pre-radiological, pre-X-ray pre changes mm -hmm. will be visible on an MRI scan. But getting MRI scans for children is not that easy. Right. OK. Shall we move on to one of your first pictures? Yeah, I just thought it would be nice to just remind your viewers about uh, the typical appearances of a, a, a child with Perthes disease. This, this child is uh, about six years old and presents with right knee pain. Um, and on clinical assessment, uh, the, the important findings are that the, the, the knee actually looks fine. There's no effusion on the knee. Uh, in examined in isolation, the range of movement in the knee is normal, uh, but it quickly becomes apparent that there is difficulty at the hip joint. Clinically, the child has a stiff hip joint. And typically there's a limitation to rotation and a limitation to abduction uh, on clinical assessment. Uh, in the more advanced cases, when there's a, de a significant degree of collapse of the femoral head, then you may notice uh, a, a leg length inequality as well. But uh, in the earlier phases, that may be difficult. So uh, to me, this looks really severe, but um, is that an, a very advanced case? Uh, it's not that it's advanced. So, so classification is uh, performed usually at a particular phase in the disease. So uh, the, the disease process, there's a necrosis process followed by fragmentation. Uh, then there is a remodeling phase and then ossification of the remodeled tissue. So there are well described phases through the disease process uh, and you classify the, you know, the prognostic indicators, uh, indicators uh, that's done usually uh, between the uh, necrosis and the fragmentation stage. And that's probably where this x-ray has been taken. So this child, there is clear signs if you compare the two sides, there's collapse of the femoral head. And, and this particular child has some worrying features. Uh, if you look at the height of the femoral head on the normal side, on the mm -hmm. left hand, on, 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 on our right hand side, the, the patient's left hip, um, and measure how high the, the lateral one third of that femoral head is, how, how tall it is. And you can see on the affected right hip, how much shorter that is. Uh, and there's a classification system called the Herring Lateral Column Classification System, which specifically looks at the amount of collapse on that lateral bit of the femoral head. The more flattened that lateral bit is, 
the more worrying it is in terms of uh, risk of, um, of poor outcome. So this child has quite a flat femoral head at this stage. Uh, and also you can see how the, the whole femoral head seems to have maybe slid out of the acetabulum slightly as well. Uh, and that predisposes to another worrying feature called hinge abduction. When this child tries to abduct the leg, moving the, the leg laterally, rather than the femoral head swiveling inside the acetabulum, the femoral head will be hinging on the edge of the acetabular socket. And that's a poor prognostic factor um, because it predisposes to secondary changes within the acetabulum. Uh, although this is a disease of the femoral head, clearly as the child grows, if the femoral head is out of, of an abnormal shape, the acetabulum may be at risk of becoming abnormally shaped as well. Okay. Um, I've had a question, couple of questions come in actually already, Simon. Um, you did say earlier on that it was difficult to get MRIs of children and someone's actually said, why is it difficult? Is it difficult because they're difficult to get anyway or is it just because kids are difficult to MRI because they wiggle? Yeah, kids are difficult to MRI because they wiggle. Uh, and so you're not necessarily going to get great quality pictures. So having to organise a sedation for a child in order to get an MRI scan is challenging. Uh, but as I said, it, in the majority of cases, the clinical signs result in referral to an appropriate specialist who will pick up the potential for perfect disease. By that stage, you'll see x-ray changes like we have on these x-rays here. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not necessary for most of the children to go through having an MRI scan. And Nick has asked a question um, about uh, leg traction during or after the birthing process. And does that contribute to femoral head pathology? Uh, for perthase disease, I'm not aware of an association with leg traction. Um, um, obviously, people are concerned about that. Uh, anything that puts the uh, hip joint at risk of vascular compromise potentially could result in this. Uh, but uh, I'm not aware that um, uh, at the time of birth that it has a direct relationship with what, with what, should, with what is going to happen maybe several years later. Um, we'll come on to talk about um, femoral head blood flow and, and the potential risks when we talk about DDH actually. Okay, right. Do you want me to move on to your next picture? Yeah, well, I just thought it'd be nice to see, uh, to show your viewers what potentially can happen over time uh, if, there, if no treatment is instigated. As I said earlier on, for, for a lot of the younger children uh, where the, uh, the outlook is very good, uh, quite often you can reliably inform the parents that all that needs to be done is to have uh, occasional clinical assessments uh, and in fact just making sure that the femoral head remains fairly well located within the acetabulum allows the remodeling and then the reossification process to provide a fairly well formed femoral head in the long run. But in this case you can see that over time this disease has progressed and we're seeing some of the typical radiological features of more uh, advanced perthase uh, with a poorer outcome. You can see the femoral head is much wider now uh, and that puts the child at risk of developing in the long run something called coxa magna which is literally big femoral head. Uh, the neck is shorter as well. A lot of these children with more severe perthase disease the growth plate will fuse early and as a result, as they grow, the femoral neck will not grow to an appropriate length. And so they'll be at risk of uh, a short femoral neck, which is called coxa breva. And you can also make out, if you compare the acetabulum between the two sides on this x-ray, how you're starting to get changes, uh, you know, equivalent changes to the shape and contour of the acetabulum as a result of the misshapen femoral head. And the misshapen femoral head, in this case, you can see the, the fragmentation of the femoral head, which is one of the, the worrying features. This is a, a, a child with perthase disease where there is extensive involvement of the femoral, femoral head rather than just one localised area with a vascular changes. Do you know how old this chap is? Uh, this child is about six and a half, seven years old. Gosh. OK, so what happens next to this um, poor little fellow? So in children where there are worrying prognostic indicators, uh, we try to avoid this sort of picture appearing. We try to pick up children who are at risk and then instigating appropriate surgical measures. And the aim of surgery in perthase disease is to try and position the femoral head correctly into the normal acetabulum, because at the end of the day, the acetabulum is normal in this condition. And as long as the femoral head is mainly sitting within the normal acetabulum, then it will remodel and then grow into a more normal spherical shape in the long run. Uh, 
Right. Uh, and so for, for the younger kids, uh, sometimes we, uh, well, historically we used to use bracing. So the children we put into an A-frame, so plaster of Paris on both legs with a broomstick between the two legs to keep the, the legs in an abducted position, which would rotate the femoral heads and put the femoral head into the acetabulum appropriately. Uh, but then later on in the older age group, uh, where we would probably be looking at the option of um, osteotomy of the femoral neck or fem the femoral uh, proximal femur to change the angle of the top of the femur so that it is aiming more directly into the acetabulum so that that natural remodeling process will progress correctly. Right. I've had a couple of questions asking at what point replacement of the hip would be indicated. So that's a great question and we will come on to that in a little while because I've got a couple of nice uh, x-rays uh, following on just to show you what the long-term prognosis can be um, uh, and uh, the good news is that uh, I don't want to spoil the, the later message but the good news is that uh, people with birth Aids disease can even where there are significant radiological changes in the long run they can put, uh, continue to have a, a very a functional uh, uh, long long functional use of their of their own hip joint before the potential need for hip replacement surgery. Uh, one of the questions actually talks about a, a person, a man who's 30 years old, who's developed low back pain and given up work as a result of having had perthes, but presumably not having had the hip replacement. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, consultants have said he's too young for a hip replacement, but he's got no quality of life at the moment and no work prospects. Um, and they're asking for your comments on that. Well, yeah, the, the worry about hip replacement surgery at the back of everyone's mind, obviously, is the longevity of the hip replacement. Uh, and so traditionally, uh, a lot of uh, surgeons have worried about replacement surgery in the younger population, uh, the potential that they would be facing revision surgery later on in life. I think most people nowadays would look upon it in this way. If you have significant intrusive symptoms because of you know, secondary degenerative change, if you're getting problems with the sacral joint or the back because of the stiffness in the hip, and if uh, the quality of life is poor, most people, most of, most of our patients would want to have quality of life now and be able to have a functional life when they're young and worry about the after effects when they're 50 or 70 or 80, they'll think about that later on. So I, I must say, I, I've never really ascribed to the, the possibility of saying, well, you're too young for this surgery. If, if, if the right plan of action is to go ahead with hip replacement surgery, um, you know, I don't think that the age necessarily comes into it. I've certainly replaced hips on people, uh, you know, in their late 20s and 30s, um, because it's the right thing to do for that person. Remind us how long the average hip replacement hip lasts. Uh, so if you look at our National Joint Registry data, uh, it tells us that the vast majority of routine hip replacements, 95% of them will last for at least 10 years, uh, over 95% will last for at least 10 years, and over 90% will last for at least 15 years. And obviously that's historical data, uh, and we hopefully are doing better now than we did 10 or 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, the other thing to comment about that data is um, it does make a difference how old you are. Uh, we know that if you replace the hip of an 80 year old who's going to live to 100, their hip will probably last for 20 years without any difficulty. If you replace the hip of a 40 year old who has an active lifestyle, maybe has an expectation to return to sports activities, squash, golf, tennis, football, cycling, etc., then because they're more active, they are probably going to be at risk of their hip replacement wearing out or loosening at an earlier age. So the younger you are when you have a hip replacement, it's more difficult to give them a clear prediction of how long that hip will last for. Is there any reliable data on how many times you could have it revised? Um, well, it depends on the complexity of revision. Uh, I've revised um, the hip of a person who, who had already had five hip replacements done. Um, uh, and that was feasible because, in fact, several of those operations had been sort of minor changes of implants rather than a, a major reshaping of the whole hip joint. So, so there's variability. Um, there are usually solutions out there. If, even if you've had a hip replacement and it's been revised on several occasions, there are usually options if it needs to be revised again. Right. So that's good news for the patient that we were talking about. Um, 
I think it, I think the, the name I've been given is hinges. Sorry, I was looking puzzled there because hinges sounds as though it's actually a, an, an orthopedic procedure. But so, yeah, um, Gail has said um, she's commenting. This is a poor kid. Uh, she wonders if his parents noticed a change in function, or was it just the pain that sent them to the doctors in this particular? Yeah, case? It's different. I think by the sta by the stage that, of the X-ray that you see here, uh, I think uh, most people would uh, would say that the, the symptoms would be very clear cut. Um, because you'd be expecting the child will probably be aware of um, significant discomfort uh, when they do anything more than just day-to-day -day activities. Um, the parents at this stage, parents would probably notice that they have a, a, a limp when they walk. Uh, and then a clinician would clearly see a reduction in range of movement, reduced flexion, specifically reduced internal rotation and reduced abduction. So I think by this stage, uh, it's usually quite clear cut. Franco sent in an interesting question. He's asked in particular whether you are likely to see any long-term damage, particularly calcification of the psoas. But I guess you could say that about any other compromised muscles. Yeah, it's, it's a possibility. In fact, with this condition, one of the bigger issues sometimes is, is the adductors. Uh, mm -hmm. So you get spasm and you get shortening of the adductors. So some of the children uh, will be well served with a minor surgical procedure, not a major reshaping or positioning of the femoral head, but a simple procedure called an, an adductor tenotomy, uh, which is uh, through a small incision on the inside of the groin to cut the adductor tendons to allow for more natural abduction movement. Right. That's, that's occasionally something that's done for, for, for kids with intrusive uh, adduction contracture. When you say cut them, do you mean completely sever them? So you sever what you need to, to allow for the limb to move to a more natural abducted position uh, and they heal up. <laughs> I think people are making up names now with these questions. Somebody called Spanx has said, uh, Spanx, I don't believe that's a name. Um, I treat three siblings. One has Sherman's uh, kyphosis, another has cardiac issues and the third has perthase. Is there any evidence to show a genetic component in the disease? So yeah, perthase disease, yeah, there is a minor possibility of genetic and obviously there are underlying conditions which predispose as well. Um, uh, as orthopedic trainees, we're taught to see if you see a child with in inverted commas bilateral perthase disease, then you have to think maybe this isn't actually perthase disease. This could be an, a different condition uh, like spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia. That's a good name to to put in the bank for storage purposes. Uh, some of the uh, storage diseases like um, uh, Hunter's disease and uh, uh, the, uh, these are um, diseases of um, uh, um, metabolic products which are stored abnormally in tissue. And some of these children will have radiological signs and clinical signs that look like bilateral perthase disease and they've got underlying medical conditions. Um, I'm, not I'm, I'm not aware of a direct correlation between Sherman's disease and perthase, but maybe there's some unrecognized syndrome as of yet. Would you like to move on to another picture? So, and we'll come yeah, back the next it. picture, I mean, we're just going through a progression here. Um, and obviously we're looking at a skeletally mature person now, uh, and you can see that in this, uh, in this x-ray that the, 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 uh, this is an adult who has previously had perthase disease and has been left with, as you can see, the, the large femoral head abnormally shaped with a very flattened upper surface, and you can see the compensatory flattening of the acetabulum as well. Uh, so as this child has come through to adulthood, the shape of the femoral head has impacted on the shape of the acetabulum. Uh, and you might think, oh, that's terrible. Uh, but in fact, um, well, these are the sort of people that you'll be surprised to discover are, are often coping and functional in day-to-day -day life. Uh, you know, they may not be the best athletes, but uh, they can cope with day-to-day -day life sometimes for, for years and decades with this malformed femoral head. Because at the end of the day, if the shape of the femoral head has affected the shape of the acetabulum so that the two mirror each other, uh, then that will actually work relatively well. The worst outlook is if you have a very flattened femoral head in a spherical socket. So a mismatch between the contour of the acetabulum and the contour of the femoral head is worse than having what you see here, which is two mated surfaces, which are sort of the same shape. This person will probably have a, an acceptable range of flexion and an extension in the, in the hip, but probably very little rotation. Uh, and that may well throw stresses elsewhere. They may complain of, as we've discussed before, say priliac and back pain, knee symptoms. At the end of the day, you need rotational movement uh, through the gait cycle somewhere and usually that's provided by the hip joint uh, 
if the hip is not able to rotate appropriately, then you start asking subconsciously, you start asking the knee to introduce more rotation than it really wants to do. And you start to develop knee symptoms secondarily. Uh, but you can then see how this sort of a, a condition, which radiographically looks quite significant, but from a functional point of view, this is the sort of person who may well cope very well with, uh, you know, decades of life with this malformed hip and maybe just appropriate physical therapy regimes to try and maintain muscle tone. Obviously, uh, uh, during the active process, these children lose muscle bulk, quads, glutes. You can regain that muscle function and try and maximize the potential for what is at the end of the day a malformed joint, but a joint that can function to an acceptable degree. Yeah. Why, why would you get a mismatch between the acetabulum and the femoral head? So the, the real problem is when you start to get changes in the femoral head late. This is why the older you are, the worse your prognosis. If you are eight or nine years old with active perthase disease, then you probably haven't got enough time ahead of you for the femoral heads to uh, remodel and ossify and then encourage the acetabulum to change yep. its shape to match the femoral head as you see here and you end up with a a, a, misfor a a malformed femoral head sitting in what looks more like a normal socket and that's a worse uh, you know that prognostically that's worse because you then get point loading at areas where where you can't really take the strain of, of the normal gait cycle okay and i think if you look if we move to the next extra i think then yeah this the this time it's the left hip uh, this is uh, really a uh, 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 towards an end stage appearance, uh, you're starting to get more degenerative appearances within this malformed hip. Again, there seems to be a fairly good mirroring, mirror between the shape of the femoral uh, head and the acetabulum, uh, but you're starting to see signs of new bone formation around the floor of the acetabulum, around the bottom of the femoral head. So this person who, again, an adult with some degenerative changes starting to appear. Is this asymmetry in the pelvis? Is that just a function of the way they're standing in the x-ray or is that... Uh, secondary, you can see there's shortening. If you look at where the tip of the greater trochanter is on that left hip uh, yeah. and, and the, the tip of the greater trochanter on the right hip, a line between those two and the line of the pelvis, you can judge just on this plain x-ray that this patient is, a, is having to cope with a, a shortened left leg. Uh, and in fact, indeed, you can see it even looking at the lesser trochanter, there's a big difference in height between where the lesser trochanter sits uh, in, in relationship to the pelvis. So this is the sort of person who may well be starting to get difficulties with this hip joint, despite maybe wearing a shoe raise or, a, or an insole inside the shoe to try and balance that length inequality. Simon, Lucy's asked us if there's any connection with what's been called irritable hip. She's dealt with a number of young lads who've been diagnosed with this. Is, is that something which could be connected? So irritable hip is a, a diagnosis of exclusion uh, once we've ruled out more serious pathologies. Um, in, in my NHS practice um, as a trauma consultant at uh, as part of the Royal Free, we get a constant stream of children coming in with, uh, with irritability of the hip joint, uh, limping, sometimes with or without a temperature. And these are the children where you run through a diagnostic sieve to come up with a potential serious diagnosis like Perthase disease or a hip infection. And for a lot of those children, uh, it's a transient synovitis. Uh, so maybe they've had a viral illness, usually a week or two beforehand, they've recovered from that viral illness, uh, all those symptoms have gone, and then they start to develop hip pain and a bit of a, a limp, uh, and clinically the hip is irritable, and the good news is that's a, a self-limiting condition. Well, that's encouraging. Um, Adam has asked how early in the development of Perthase does the Trendelenburg test become positive? Is it positive due to pain or is it due to only after movement, he says? So Trendelenburg's test is an assessment of the overall function in the hip and also specifically the abductor muscles that attach to the side of the hip, uh, the, the side of the, of the femur. Uh, and actually within an early phase of the disease, especially if there is irritability in the hip, then the pain will result in, uh, 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 you know, the, the abductor muscles switch off 
so there is a, a tendency to have an abductor um, uh, mismatch and then a, a lurch, which is the, the typical appearance of the Trendelenburg gait. In the long run, they will retain a Trendelenburg test um, because they have wasting, muscle wasting with the abductor muscles. Um, okay. So it is an early sign. We're spending an awful lot of time on perphase when we were going to go on to hip dysplasia, but uh, I've still right. got more we questions. Can, can, um, I don't mind. My, uh, the, the viewer who is calling themselves Hinges, I'm not sure if that's a name or one of the nicknames that comes out of uh, one of our groups, uh, says, would you build up this patient's shoe because of that leg length difference? So what you'll see often is there's a, a marked shortening at the site of the hip joint and the femoral neck. Uh, as the child grows, they may have a compensatory increasing growth lower down the leg. So although on the pelvic x-ray looks like a huge difference, in real terms, there may be a minor difference. My preference would be to say, uh, you know, if the difference, uh, the apparent leg length difference on examination is in, in the order of a centimeter or so, even though looking at this x-ray, you think there's gonna be three centimeters difference. If in fact, there's only a centimeter difference, a lot of patients don't want to have a shoe raise because that's visible externally and they'll accept a smaller insole even though it's not completely resolving their leg length difference even if it helps to adjust their leg length difference they'll happily take maybe half a centimeter of an insole which is invisible to the rest of the world rather than having their one and a half centimeters built up onto the the underside of the shoe um, but it's it's up to a discussion you know, with all these things. You have to have a, a sensible discussion with your patient as to what their expectations are. OK, would you like us to move on? Yeah, we'll just flick through the rest of these and then we can move on to DDH. This is a, just a series of x-rays showing up the, 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 the long term outlook. Um, this is a patient who's in her 50s uh, who has had perthase uh, and has developed secondary degenerative arthritis. There's no joint space. Uh, a lot of pain uh, and this patient is at the stage where hip replacement surgery is appropriate. Technically speaking it's more challenging to do a hip replacement for somebody with this abnormal anatomy but it's not impossible. If we flick through the series of x-rays in turn we've got a close-up, the next x-ray shows a close-up of the uh, hip joint uh, and then the next slide shows the CT scan showing the amount of cyst formation within the femoral head, which is a side effect of the degenerative arthritic process. And then the x-ray showing the post-op appearance having had a successful hip replacement. Um, you'll notice that we haven't brought the femoral uh, shaft down as much as you would have thought maybe we'd try to do. The, the distance from the tip of the trochanter to the edge of the acetabular hasn't changed that much. This hip has been short for decades. If you try and correct, completely correct the leg length inequality by jacking out the hip with a hip replacement in what would be called termed, you know, in, in inverted commas, in the right place, uh, you are at much greater risk of causing nerve injury, particularly sciat sciatic nerve palsy. So we will elect to put in the hip replacement to some extent where the hip joint requires it to be rather than aiming for a full correction of leg length. Okay, which leads us on to hip dysplasia. Yeah, so what I learned uh, as, a, as a medical student, CDH, congenital dislocation of the hip, uh, which has now changed its name to developmental dysplasia of the hip. Um, this is uh, a much more common condition in the community. Uh, about one in a thousand children are born with a dislocated hip and something like eight to ten per thousand of the population are born with unstable hips or a clicky hip at risk of dislocation. So this is a much more prevalent condition, uh, uh, much more common in, young, uh, in girls than boys. Uh, and the etiological factors, this is often a, a packaging disorder problem. So this is the sort of condition that's associated with uh, firstborn breach presentations where the baby uh, is uh, in the wrong position in utero. These are the children who are also at risk of other conditions like torticollis of the neck. Um, and there is a family history uh, for some of these. There's a, a genetic disposition for some. Uh, I'm not talking here about the severe bilateral hip dislocations that you get in some of the children with uh, teratogenic problems. These are, you know, multifactorial problems. These are the, the, the straightforward dis developmental dysplasias. Uh, and all children are screened at birth uh, by the paediatrician uh, to check for signs of a clicky hip or a dislocated hip. 
there are some features which will pre, uh, uh, suggest to the clinician like skin crease asymmetry um, clearly not to be uh, the case if you have bilateral dislocated hips you won't see any symmetry because both sides the skin creases are abnormal but they're equally abnormal um, a lot of children a lot of babies newborns which have clicky hips will spontaneously stabilize and don't have any problem and don't require further intervention yeah. this is just part and parcel of the normal clinical examination um, the uh, tests that we use at birth uh, are uh, flex, uh, abduction and um, uh, ab, uh, flexion examinations the, the barlow test is uh, commonly performed to try and see if a hip is unstable and dislocatable from a uh, from a located position and the reverse of that test is called the Ortolani test uh, that's the test where you clunk a dislocated hip back into joint sounds gruesome but the, the 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 babies they don't really seem to be that adversely concerned about it at the time obviously you don't want to repeat the tests again and again and again if you identify a clicky hip uh, then the next stage is to consider appropriate treatments to try and make sure that hip stays stable uh, and those children will usually put it be put into a pavlik harness we'll be coming onto a picture of that in a second uh, and we'll often have up to the age of about four months ultrasound scans are useful both as a diagnostic uh, tool to identify uh, uh, hip instability uh, and also as a uh, as a screening to check that the hip is correctly reduced uh, once uh, the child has been put into a into a pavlik harness you know, I'd never actually considered that it must be quite difficult to diagnose a dislocated hip in a baby. You know, in an adult, a dislocated joint would either be obvious because of what they tell you or because of how the joint looks. Mm. Um, and you're missing at least one of those factors with a baby, aren't you? Well, bilateral hip dislocation as a baby is a difficult one. We've got a great slide to show you in a minute, which will maybe surprise a few of our viewers. Um, if you move on, these are some of the typical features that you'll see that bottom left, you can see what a pavlik harness looks like designed to hold the hips in an appropriate position uh, so that they remain well located. The, the overall aim of treatment of children with developmental dysplasia of the hip is to have the femoral head sitting in the acetabulum through whichever method possible so that the acetabulum and the head grow normally. Uh, whether that can be achieved just with the use of a harness, uh, if treatment with a harness fails then the next stage would be to consider having a open reduction so surgery where the hip is uh, opened and reduced into joint and then held in joint and then later on if that still hasn't been successful then some of these children will end up with bone surgery uh, as you can see on the on the uh, picture on the right this is a child who's had both a femoral and a pelvic osteotomy to try and maintain the position of the femoral head within the acetabulum these uh, these white lines, the uh, diagonal white lines, are on they the right hand picture on the right hand picture? Those are wires skewered yeah. through the broken bone to hold the socket in the correct alignment uh, so that the femoral head won't drift out. If you look at the picture on the left hand side, those are superimposed lines on the X-ray, mm. which are just showing you that the uh, the on that picture, the, the child's right hip is dislocated. Uh, and but you can also see that the socket on that right hand side, the, sh the, the slope of the socket is wrong. Uh, and so this is a, uh, a multifactorial problem for, for children with dislocated hips. They don't only have an abnormality of rotation and alignment of the femoral head and neck, but often the, the socket itself, the acetabulum is shallow and mal malformed and predisposes to allowing the femoral head to sublux or dislocate out. This is what I see more frequently. So, uh, I mean, I have a predominant, I have an adult, predominantly adult hip practice. Mm. And what I will see is adults, this is a, a lady in her um, early thirties who has a bit of hypermobility uh, and has always, for as long as she can remember, always had a bit of a funny gait. She waddles a bit and she's not the sportiest. I mean, she's not overweight, but she's not been able to achieve sports you know the level of sport activity she would hope to achieve and her hips have become painful and radiologically she has ddh uh, but in her case she has uh, the, the hip joints are well located but i think your viewers will probably see that her sockets both sides but left worse than right the socket is very shallow with a quite a vertical roof rather than the usual coverage that you get to the femoral head, there's a degree of uncovering of the femoral head. 
which predisposes to overload of the cartilage within the hip joint in an abnormal fashion. But also uh, she has femoral changes, typical femoral changes. Uh, people with DDH, they tend to have very vertical femoral necks, what we call a valgus femoral neck, uh, a long femoral neck. And the rotational profile of the femoral neck is wrong as well. A lot of these people have uh, what we call femoral neck antiversion. Uh, so uh, the, the femoral head and the femoral neck are pointing forwards. And in order to keep the hip located correctly, the, 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 the leg has to be internally rotated in a compensatory fashion to keep the femoral head in place. A lot of these children, when they're, when they're youngsters, they may well have an intoed gait. As they grow up, they'll develop uh, external tibial torsion, rotation of the tibia to compensate. So at, at adulthood, their feet will point forwards, but their femoral necks will still be pointing the wrong way. Uh, and for these sort of people, uh, sometimes when they're in their 20s, uh, they may find that it's appropriate to consider having uh, osteotomy surgery at that stage to try and maintain their own uh, hip joint and give it longevity. Uh, when they're in their 40s or 50s and start to develop degenerative arthritic change, then these are the sort of people that end up with hip replacement surgery, maybe at a younger age than the average uh, uh, population. Is osteotomy a relatively um, innocuous form of surgery? Oh, not at all. I mean, uh, you're breaking the bone, correcting alignment and then fixing it. You need to get the alignment correct. So accuracy is important. You know, we want to achieve the correct outcome. Then you have the issue of making sure that the bone heals up. Uh, if, uh, if the bone doesn't heal correctly, uh, some, some people will have ongoing symptoms because of delayed union. And unfortunately, some people will end up with uh, non-union and a non-union is a severe problem. Thankfully rare, but uh, you wouldn't want to necessarily start considering this sort of osteotomy surgery on someone who's a, a heavy smoker. We know that smoking uh, has a very direct correlation with poor union of bone uh, and uh, that needs to be taken into account. Okay. If we, so, if we go to the next page. So this is uh, just a, a model of a pelvis to give some idea of uh, a periacetabular osteotomy. This is a surgery that can be done in a young adult to try and recorrect the slope and shape of the acetabulum so that the young adults biomechanics are more corrected. Uh, um, this isn't the sort of surgery that I routinely perform uh, but I have a colleague who, who does uh, and quite typically um, uh, athletic people in their 20s who are getting hip pain or groin pain because of uh, a degree of dysplasia may consider may be considered appropriate for having this sort of a periacetabular osteotomy where the alignment of their socket is changed. This is called a, a Gantz osteotomy, I named after the surgeon uh, who developed it. And the next slide I think shows the uh, outcome after successful Gantz osteotomy for somebody with developmental dysplasia. Uh, I don't have the preoperative x-ray unfortunately, but the postoperative x-ray uh, you'll just have to take my word for it that the, the coverage of that femoral head is now much better. You have a more correct uh, alignment of the acetabulum now so that hopefully this young adult will be able to uh, have a long uh, lifespan to their the native hip joint. And then the next slide, this is a case that came to see me, a lady aged about 40. She had a dislocated hip as a baby. Uh, she tells me that at the age of about one, she had an operation uh, to try and put the ball back into the socket, uh, which was uh, an operation done through uh, a groin incision. Uh, unfortunately, she had ongoing problems. And so at the age of about seven, she had a what we call a derotation femoral osteotomy to try and correct the alignment and rotation of the femoral neck so that, again, the femoral head would sit inside the socket correctly. Uh, by the age of 10, she'd had that metalwork removed, and you can just about see the after effects of that metalwork on the proximal femur. Uh, there are some sclerotic lines across the upper part of the femur where the screws for the plate and she had a plate and screws put in. Uh, that's all been removed, but now she's 40 years old and she's getting severe symptoms from her arthritic hip, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, she is going to be having a hip replacement in the very near future uh, because, unfortunately, in her case, the, uh, the treatments uh, for her developmental dysplasia has not given her uh, more than 40 years worth of successful uh, outcome for her hip. 
And if she's standing upright, then this uh, X-ray suggests that she's got an even worse leg length difference than the previous slide we looked at. Uh, interestingly enough, if you examine her uh, in recumbency on the on the examination couch, the, the the actual leg length difference is only in the order of about half a centimeter to a centimeter. Uh, quite interesting because she, as I said before, she's grown up and she's had a compensatory lengthening uh, excess growth within the 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 the, the, the lower part, the, the knee joint and the tibia which has allowed for her to have a degree of compensation. Just showing her, her the side view of the, the, that same hip joint. And I think we've got a CT scan that shows up quite nicely the antiversion problem that she still has. So that's uh, on, her, on our left-hand side, her right hip, you can see how forwards pointing the femoral neck is on her symptomatic arthritic right hip compared to the normal alignment that she has in the left hip. And that's something we have to correct when we do her hip replacement. We have to put in the femoral stem. Uh, the ball has to be in the correct rotational profile for her leg so that uh, she has a stable hip joint. Simon, you've taken us right up to the, the last second of our scheduled time, which is oh, uh, very, very clever of you, given, the, given all the information you're imparting there. Um, and very kind of you to give up your time. Um, My pleasure. Uh, in terms of the aftercare of people like this, I mean, you talked a bit about um, hip replacements in the past, but in terms of young children, should we be concerned about how we might manage their physical care? For, for children with developmental dysplasia. Um, uh, so uh, the good news is that as long as their early treatment is successful, then we'd like to encourage them to have a full and active life. And uh, if, uh, if they need to have appropriate uh, physical therapy input to maintain muscle strength, to improve mobility and flexibility if they need it, then that's fine. You're not going to be putting their hip joint at risk. You're not going to be causing further damage to their hip joint. Uh, sadly, if they've got the starts of degenerative change, uh, you know, predictably due to them in the future because of the condition, I don't think that, uh, you know, um, uh, as um, uh, I don't think that the sort of management that you will instigate is going to change that process at all um, so hopefully you will be doing them a good service by maintaining their quality of life when they can do and in the long run if they end up with a degenerative hip joint and they need to see somebody like me for a hip replacement so be it right well from everything you've told us i hope when they do need their hip replacement it is you they see because um, you've talked a lot about uh, your approach to hips and i think you've given people a lot of confidence in the operation but you've imparted a lot more information to us today. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, I hope we'll be seeing you on the show again soon sometime. Uh, it's my pleasure. Always nice to speak to you. Thanks very much. All right, it's our pleasure. Thank you.